Thank you. Yeah, both the songs you sang this morning are really uh, perfect for what we're going to be talking about today. So thanks for singing my talk. <laughs> you know, I think it was um, Michael Beckwith who used to say, or probably still says, that music penetrates beyond our thinking capabilities to a place within us and right down to our soul and speaks to us in a way that words can't. So thanks for being part of that today. I appreciate it. So my name is um, Alice Reed, and I'm the spiritual director here at Centers for Spiritual Living. And um, I'm really happy to be back with you here again today. Hey, Patrick. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about you this morning. Patrick had a little, little uh, health event, but he's back. I'm really happy that that's happening. Um, for you and a demonstration of the power of this teaching that really moves our physicality into a place of wholeness over and over and over again. Uh, I want to cue you up a little bit. This um, next month, October, we are going to be rocking the house. We are going to be doing some wonderful uh, uh, practices and some workshops. We're going to be really leaning into some true adventure, in, adventures in faith as we look at this topic of playing with paradoxes. We're also going to be looking at who we are as a community and, and where we want to be and what's our next move and what's next for Centers for Spiritual Living Capistrano Valley. Um, so we're going we're gonna to lean in, and what that means is on October 1st, I hope you'll consider staying after the service for a really potent and powerful practice. I affectionately call it the fear to faith practice. It's a practice where we can see those places where we might have been stuck based on our past, and then we um, offer a beautiful practice to release the power of that so that we can step into wholeness. And in the second... Um, month, week of the month, we're going to have a town hall meeting after the service, and we'll be really looking at Centers for Spiritual Living, and we've been here for 11 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so I think it's time to look ahead, and so we'll be talking about that at our town hall meeting on um, the second uh, Sunday in October. On the third Sunday in October, we're going to do a community visioning after the service. So come for that because that'll be a powerful way. If you haven't done visioning, it's a beautiful practice of opening ourselves up to inspiration in a mystical fashion. And it really is available to everyone. And then on the fourth week in October, we're going to wrap up our adventures in faith with a concert and a luau with the Kalama brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so all that time as we do these little uh, workshops after the service, during the service, we're going to be talking about paradoxes, and we're going to be looking at those places where paradox can really help us to open up and see a bigger picture. So are you in? Yes. Yeah. You do not want to miss this. It's going to be a great month. And the name of the program this year in October is No Matter the Question, Love is the answer. It's a great quote. I believe it's attributable to um, Wayne D Dyer. And we're going to be using that as our focus. Because I have a lot of questions. And I need your help as we look at those questions and, and lean into capturing what the answers are. And love is going to take us there. We're. Um, we're still living out loud. Are you all still living out loud this, month, yeah. this year? That's our theme for the year. And, and, and this month, it's loving out loud. And we've touched on a bunch of different topics. We talked about choosing self-care and self-love and really moving into that place of loving ourselves enough so that we don't use any uh, discord within ourselves to project that out onto others. So self-love is paramount, and number one, it's like putting the oxygen mask on first before you try to help others. It's dropping into a place of really knowing your wholeness. 
And then in week two, we talked about choosing love without condition, and that means that love is love no matter what. Love is love no matter what. And while there might be some othering going on in our world, we know that there's no impediment, there's no box to check, that, that regardless of who you are, you get to choose how you want to love. Last week, I was glad to see your, finally saw your talk over the weekend, Reverend Karen, and it was amazing. Love thy neighbor. And um, she could have wrapped up the whole, <laughs> it was really great. She could have wrapped up the whole month with, with her talk because she really, really captured this idea of going deep with this idea of loving your neighbor and folded it into self-love, um, love without condition, and then expressing that out in the world in some fashion. So today, Love Wins. <laughs> That's our talk title this today. And um, as I looked at that title, now, I, you, you show up on game night, you'll see just how competitive I am. <laughs> I enjoy a good game. But I don't like to think of love as some kind of competition, right? Um, and yet, love wins is a potent statement that really bubbled up in 2015 when, I believe it was in June of 2015 when the Supreme Court um, ruled that say, uh, banning same-sex marriage was unconstitutional. Yes. Yeah, right, right. It was, it, was, it was a monumental moment in the equality movement and it changed the lives of countless individuals who now had their love for each other validated by the law of the land. And, the, and as the plaintiffs who had taken that all the way to the su Supreme Court, um, the lawyer and the plaintiff got on the steps of the Supreme Court in front of everybody and the, and the reporters, they said, love wins. And it became this thing that was really the um, beautiful call to equality. And so, from that perspective, <laughs> you know, it was a lot to celebrate. And so from that perspective, I can see that, that love wins. But what I want to look at a little bit is how sometimes we can go to the fight to try to win something before we anchor ourselves in consciousness. And that the truth is there is nothing to fight. There's this um, beautiful quote that I heard, and I, and I can't tell you who it's attributable to, um, but I learned it in conjunction with studying some work by Emma Curtis Hopkins, and it goes like this, that beauty is what love looks like, and joy is what love feels like. And I would complete that by saying that wholeness is what constitutes love. That it may, it may look like beauty and it may feel like joy, but the truth is it's wholeness in expression. And so when we find ourselves in these places where we um, need to uh, fight, when we, when we feel the need to um, fight against something, well, I, I kind of want to, I want you to consider this wonderful axiom, a paradox, if you will, that we have to surrender to win, that we have to surrender the fight first that we have to surrender to, to the divinity within, that we have to surrender to the highest principle of wholeness, and that once we surrender, once we allow ourselves to drop into that highest ideal of wholeness, well, then we'll be led to some kind of action. Then we'll be led to some kind of idea. Then we'll be led to some kind of thought or, or stand that we need to take that will be, I'm not saying that, the, that we don't need to take a stand for things. I'm not saying that it, 
it isn't important to say no to injustice. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that if we can ground ourselves first in love, if we can find that place, that equalizer, if you will, so that we can be clear and be clear channels for love, well, then any action we take from that point is born out of wholeness. And, in, and instead of having all, the, you know, all that wind up around the energy that we have to fight something, we've got the energy of purpose. We've got the energy of wholeness. We've got the energy of perfection that we can stand in. 17 years old. I had 210,000 miles on it. Boy, that car was loved. <laughs> and uh, I knew it was time to buy a new car. And of course, the technology is amazing, right? So I bought a um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Wow. Wow. So it's pretty cool. I can drive it uh, all electric most of the time. And then when I need to go dis the distance, I can drive in hybrid. Um, but it has this function called regenerative brakes. And it kind of causes the power of resistance to create energy. When I'm coasting or braking, when I'm not actually moving forward, my car is creating power. And I want to tell you that love is regenerative too. That when we come to a place of groundedness and centeredness within ourselves, that, 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 that wholeness and beauty and joy that is, and, and of course I'm pigeonholing something that can't be pigeonholed because love is so big, but this this power of love, it regenerates itself within us and it allows us to move forward from a power that is bigger than me and it's bigger than you, it's bigger than the, the what is it, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So, so as, we, as we look at around in the world, and, and I, gosh, Karen, you said it so beautifully about how we, you know, there's so many uh, problems out there. There's so many things that we can see that are wrong. But when we come back to ourselves and begin to understand the power of love and we can surrender to it and then move into our spiritual practice, it's kind of like putting the brake on the action. It's kind of like coasting a little bit. It may feel like an antithesis of what we want to do. Move the world, move the needle, move the issue. No, I'm not going to talk about that this morning. <laughs> what I, um, you know, I want to come back to 1 Corinthians 13, that love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Well, I could do a whole talk dissecting that piece. Now, this is obviously not the old English version that you might be used to. This is the new translation version. But it talks about this power of love that when we can drop into it, it will shift any situation. I had an experience on Friday. I was, had a little home improvement project. So I thought I would build some shelves, you know, the kind that just kind of, you know, you push it together, no tools, easy peasy, you know, I'm, I live alone, I was married to a contractor for 31 years, so this is not my highest, highest skill set. I always counted on my uh, ex-husband to do these kind of things. So I was feeling pretty good about myself, I got a good deal on the shelves, and I, and I started to assemble them, and I was going to put them in my shed, so I, I took everything out of the shed, and um, it was going great. And suddenly I, 
I'm standing there and one of the plastic bins that was piled up fell over onto a pipe. And the next thing I knew, water was shooting six feet in the air. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm, I'm minutes, in minutes, seconds, I'm soaked to the bone. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out where the lever is to turn off the water because I know there's got to be one. And, and I can't find it anywhere, so I begin to panic. I think maybe I've broken a pipe that's beyond the valve, and I'm screaming for help, and I'm panicking, and I'm anxious, and I'm making phone calls, and, you know, uh, finally the owner of the, uh, the community that I live in comes by with uh, one of the workers, and they walk up, and the guy just leans down below the, the puddle of water and oh, turns the water off. Oh my God. And the first words out of the owner of the park was, oh, that's your pipe, that's your responsibility. You'll have to pay for that. And I, you know, them's fighting words, right? <laughs> and I, and I kind of looked at him blinky eyed because I've been like in this whole trauma response the whole time as I've got trying to figure out, you know, I had like books and paper and there's water everywhere. <laughs> And, the, and the, his helper says to me, well, do you want me to fix that? You'll have to pay me double, it's my day off. And I'm like, oh. So I'm, I'm like, I'm having this little reaction inside, like, you know, what the heck? And that's not what I was thinking. And um, something in me softened. And I just simply said, well, of course. Of course this is my responsibility, and of course, you know, I want it fixed, and of course I'll pay you what you have to do to take care of this. And while this doesn't sound like this big thing we call love, it was me making a choice for peace and for love and to have an experience of wholeness. Now, the guy who told me it's my day off, and you're going to have to pay me, he was darling. <laughs> chatty, we talked about camping, because my camping gear is all over the place, and I'm trying to dry stuff off, and he's fixing my pipe. Um, I had a great time working with him, and when it came time to pay him, it was a joy, and I wish I had, I did not, actually, for what he wanted was exactly the amount of cash I had, or I would have given him a nice tip. And, and I'm sure, if you found yourself in a similar situation, and immediately people start doing that territory thing, you know, where they're going to like put the line in the sand and this isn't my problem. Like, that's, those are the times when we, our ego wants to step on, up and protect us. But instead I want to suggest that if you allow yourself to pause for a minute, be a little vulnerable, take a little responsibility, What's yours? And that's, you know, that wasn't mine, that whole thing with the, with the uh, owner. That wasn't my stuff. That was his stuff. There's a lot of, um, I guess the way I would put it is, there's a lot of folks in fear. In fear for what, you know, they're going to lose what's theirs or they're going to have to give away what's theirs or someone's going to take away what's theirs. There's a lot of fear out there in the world. But what I know about love is that love always triumphs over fear. That when we look at this idea of love wins, it isn't that I slayed these two gentlemen who came up and you know, were a little bit threatening to a woman who was feeling a little, <laughs> I was feeling pretty helpless and powerless at the moment. They weren't trying to, to um, squash me or anything like that. They were just in fear, and I didn't respond with fear. So I allowed myself to respond with love. I, and as subtle as it was, it made for a much better afternoon as the day went on. The other thing I know about love is that it transcends boundaries. Like, it doesn't know us and them. It doesn't understand this idea of yours and mine. It only knows wholeness. It only knows oneness. And so when we can engage love in our uh, relationships, when we can, or our exchanges with strangers, <laughs> 
when we can engage, uh, I'll call it a vibration of love, because, I mean, I wasn't going to say to the property owner when he demanded that it was my responsibility and I'd have to pay for it, I wasn't going to say, oh, I love you. <laughs> you know, they might have turned tail and ran. <laughs> But I, I changed my vibration, right? I changed my vibration because I knew that that fighting was not going to get me anywhere. The other thing that we know about love is that it's always a force for healing. It can repair the things that we have no idea how to repair. It can repair a broken heart. It can, a kind word to somebody who's having a frustrating day can repair a day that's, go, you know, been going south all day um, where someone feels uh, supported. Um, the reason I had such a nice time talking to the, the worker in my community was um, because I felt supported. Like, I, he, I engaged him, and he engaged me, and then I felt that support. Like, that's what love will do. It will, it will find a way for us to feel supported. The other thing that um, love does is it prompts us to some action, however subtle or however direct it is. That when we engage love, when we come to that place of, of being centered in peace, in beauty, in joy, in wholeness, when we center ourselves in that, well, then we'll, we'll be prompted to take some action, even, even if it's just to relax a little and look at the big picture. I do find that our culture has sort of evolved into this place where we're always trying to fix things. We're always trying to make things right. The, um, the thing I wasn't going to talk about, I think I'll talk about a little bit here. We, um, right now, there are over 520 bills so far this year that are anti-LBGTQ in the various states. 520, it's, it's more than... Uh, the total of the last five years that of bills that have been brought forward. And about 70 of them have passed. And we have all this, this energy against, all this energy with um, trying to fight something, all this energy of fear of, of something clearly that is scaring our populace and trying to fix something that doesn't need to be fixed. And the reason I bring it up is that you have all this legislation about 10% of the population. Like, you would think like something like hunger or fixing the federal budget or, you know, some of these really big problems in our country would be worth paying attention to. But what I know about fear is that it, it gets us at the, the, like the low-hanging fruit and distracts us and keeps us in the dark. And so when we begin to engage love, well, then we can recognize that it's transcending boundaries and that it's going to heal whatever it is that's in front of us, and then it, and it prompts us to act in a way that is supportive of the situation. And, and the last thing I want to say about love is that it... Um, it requires practice. It, it isn't often the first thing we reach for <laughs> in a tense situation or a stressful situation. Often love is the second thing we think about. And so I want to encourage you to practice it in the, in the easy places in your life. And then practice it in the places that aren't so easy. So that when you're in the impossible situations, the situations that seem that there's just no way through, you'll have built the muscle to draw from love, to draw from the power the greater, that is greater than us, that, that Holmes talks about this as we talk about our, our philosophy. Holmes says that there is a power in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it. And what I want to add to 
is when we find ourselves in those difficult situations, those impossible places where there's no way out, there's no cure, there's, there's no solution, and we adopt the place of standing in the truth of love, that not only is there a power in the universe greater than you and you could use it, but it can use you. I want to be used up when I'm done. I want love to use me completely so that there's nothing left. And I hope the same for you. Ernest Holmes has a couple of quotes that I'll wrap this up with about love. He says, nothing can keep us from the love of God. What a comfort, exclamation point. What a joy to know that all is well with the soul. And when he's talking about this idea that even the, the condition, the experience, the circumstance that comes up that doesn't look anything like love is not an obstacle. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to draw upon that wealth of love, that practice of love that we continue to, to uh, lean into. And, and he goes on to say that if we look at love long enough, we shall become lovely, for this is the way of love. God is love. If we gaze longingly at joy, it will make its home with us, and we shall enter its portals and be happy. Yeah. Love is the only answer. The, what the world needs is love. And what I want to let you know is spirit wants to use you as its emissary, as its vehicle, so that we can. This is our calling. And when we accept it as our calling, love wins. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's do what we do so well, and that is to invoke the power of love in prayer. And so know with me now that as we have gathered here today, each one of us is an individuated piece of the power and the presence of the loving force of spirit. That as we move through the rest of our day and into tomorrow and the rest of this week, that there is a guiding light, a reminder that nothing is impossible, that there is no power in obstacles or problems, but that our true power lies in embracing love, in choosing love, in denying the power of hatred and bias and prejudice and racism and otherism, and instead choosing the power of love which brings us home to oneness over and over and over again. It never fails. It's always there. And ours is to invite it in. And so I know for each one that you know love, not romantic love, but agape love. You can have romantic love too. But we're talking about that love that transcends all boundaries, that knows no limit, that heals everything unlike it, that dissolves fear and brings us home to each other over and over and over again. So I know this for you. I know this for myself. I know this for all humankind. May we be blessed. May we be happy. May we be wise. I let this go. I let it be. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you so much. <laughs>